Hey there, Brian Goulet, co-founder of GouletPens.com. This is another episode of Goulet Q&A. This is number 30. 30, that's crazy. I just can't believe it's been 30. I know every week I say, I can't believe it's been X number, but you know, 30s is crazy. I turned 30 last week and now here episode 30, it's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, so this week the theme is using your fountain pens at work. And I got a lot of questions, just a ton of them. Got like th over 30 different questions. Some of the questions were not related to work necessarily, so I saved them because I got so many different questions. And I usually what happens is I'll get a bunch of questions and I'll kind of just start answering them to see because I don't want to I don't want to answer a question in the Q and A that I really don't know anything about or that I don't feel will add kind of value to the person that asked the question. So. I will kind of just go through and be like, all right, what, is, what would be my answer to this question? And if it's good, I'll be like, okay, yeah, I'll include this. If it's, if it's something I can't do or is, is more relevant to a theme in a later week, that's what I'll do. Um, this week, I just kind of started answering them. I was like, oh, okay, you know, some of these are, you know, I don't, I don't nail them, but it would still be good to you know, answer the question. And other ones are like, yeah, I could definitely help with this. And, you know, I just ended up with, with 28 this time. And I know from having done so many Q&As that 28 questions is uh, just way too many for a single video because then it runs into being so long that I actually can't even copy the question and put it in the YouTube description because there's a 5,000 character limit. And I literally can't even put the questions in there. So it's like, all right, that's, that's kind of a definitive way to say like, Brian, you need to shut up and stop talking so long in this video. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to shoot this in actually two different segments, make it into two different videos. At least that's the plan. You know, sometimes I fly by to see my pants, but that's going to be my plan is I want to make this a two-parter. Okay. Because I got a lot of good questions. I don't really want to, um, you know, I don't really want to have to cut any more out than I already have, because I did get a lot of really good questions that I think will be kind of engaging. So um, that said, you know, I've got a, I've got a bunch of questions here. I'm, I need to have lunch in 35 minutes because uh, that's when my kids want to eat. So I'm gonna answer as many questions as I can before that. I'll stop the video and then we'll pick it back up. So um, as we get into it here, I do wanna say that uh, I'm gonna be talking about using your fountain pens at work. Now me personally, my work is fountain pens. So my work environment and the culture that I have here around the use of fountain pens at work perhaps is a little bit different than yours. So my personal experience, which I almost always draw from when I'm giving this type of advice, may not be directly interpreted into your particular situation. So you've got to interpret that from, you know, what I'm saying to what is acceptable in your work culture, as well as what you feel comfortable doing in your work environment. Uh, so that said, I've also gotten a lot of questions that aren't necessarily related to things that I've been able to draw from based on my own experience. However, I've talked to a lot of people, read a lot of things on forums, and I'll give you the best answers that I can based on what I know that other people kind of commonly do. All right. So just wanted to kind of get that disclaimer out there. So um, as we get into it here. Uh, I will give you my best shot. So, okay, the first question I have is from Emily W. on Facebook. I'm lucky enough to work in a place where I can push the boundaries in terms of ink colors, and I want to make the most of it. I'm happy with my samples of Noodler's Army Green and Diamine Syrah. Those are awesome colors. And I'd like to add a few more inks to the rotation. Do you have any recommendations for inks that are slightly out of the ordinary but still work appropriate? So yeah, I do get a lot of questions related to this. I've actually answered some in the past Q and A's. I can't even tell you which ones though because there's you know 30 of them now. Um, so I kind of broke it down. There's kind of three colors. Okay, so you can go with like the brown route. There's the dusty purple route. Uh, there's a green route. Some people can use really dark reds, things like that. So typically at work, you'll use like a black or a blue black, which is essentially just a really dark blue, maybe a, a solid blue, like a darker royal blue. Those are all generally pretty acceptable at work. When you get into kind of pushing the boundaries, you don't want to use like a hot pink or something because that's going to look ridiculous in most places. Now, there are some places that's cool, but if you're talking about just kind of slightly pushing the boundaries, I usually go to dusty purples, browns, and greens. Okay, so I've got just a couple recommendations on each of those based on some of my favorites. Dusty purples, I like Diamond Damson. Um, J. Urban Pussier de Lune is another one that is um, very, very similar to that. Uh, and Noodler's Nightshade, that's a really dark purple. And those would all be kind of darker, muted colors that would that would stand out but not be so bold where you'd see it from across the room you know 
Um, browns, if you want some darker browns, you know, I like Noodler's Walnut is a good one. Uh, and then Diming Chocolate Brown, that's like a Hershey chocolate brown color. I like that one. Uh, and then greens, um, these are, you know, you like army green, so a PR avocado is another one. That's another kind of olivey green. Uh, and then Noodler Zhivago is a really, really dark green, similar in the way that Noodler's Nightshade is really dark, almost like a black with a hint of purple and nightshade, but then Zhivago is like black with a hint of green. So those are some kind of fun inks that you could uh, try out in your, in your environment. Okay. Uh, the, Forgive me, I'm gonna botch your name. Debasi, we'll go with that. G on Facebook. Uh, you know, I know I totally botched that, I'm sorry. Uh, you know this whole thing uh, about changing everything else for the sake of using a fountain pen is pretty lame. <laughs> People should know which pens write well on the worst quality workplace paper. I would like to see a recommendation on smooth writing extra fine nibs on copy papers. The point is mainstream folks should appreciate a fountain pen. And this is the philosophy that makes Nathan of Noodler stand out. Um, okay, so, you know, I agree with you. It's great to be able to just use a pen and not have to change your whole world. I don't think it's that you have to change your whole world, but I think it's more that once you get into larger nibs and cool ink colors and you can get into shading and other properties of the ink, it's more like you want to have better paper and things like that to get those cooler aspects of out of the fountain pens but it's if you're looking at fountain pens as purely as like a practical utilitarian kind of purpose yeah you don't have to change your whole world you really don't um so yeah definitely you want to stick with finer nibs okay the finer the better because generally speaking when you're dealing with workplaces your employer is going to not necessarily take fountain pen usage into consideration when shopping for paper, right? They're generally gonna buy the lowest cost inkjet printer copier paper that they can get because it's cheap and they probably use a ton of it. Um, so, you know, I, I know this because we use paper a lot around the office and uh, our purpose is a little bit different here because we're buying paper and we're writing handwritten notes on every order that we send out. So it kind of has to be, uh, uh, suitable for fountain pens, but that's not the situation with most people at work. Usually you're getting a cheap inkjet printer that's super absorbent and you write with it on a fountain pen and the ink spreads out like crazy. And if you have a really broad nib or a really wet pen, a really wet ink, it's gonna absorb through and bleed through the back and feather like crazy and look terrible because the paper's not good. Four fountain pens, that is. So that said, the finer the nib, the better the chance you have of having a readable handwriting in that case. Um, so I would recommend, you know, the Japanese pens definitely have the finest ones. If you can get it like a Japanese extra fine, that is the way to go. But however, even the Japanese, most of the Japanese fine nibs are ground pretty fine. That's just a cultural thing. You know, Pilot, Sailor, uh, Platinum, those are all Japanese companies. They grind all their own nibs and they grind them very fine. So the Pilot Metropolitan in fine is one of my favorite. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. They had a medium nib version that was comparable to most other fine nibs from the European companies. But the fine Pilot Metropolitan nib that just came out is really, really great. So, and it's, and it's an, an affordable pen, 15 bucks. Great, great pen. Um, so that's a good one. Um, if you wanna go like the Lamy route, you know, Safari, the All-Star, you get that with an extra fine nib, which is gonna be pretty comparable to the Pilot fine. You can get Twisby in an extra fine nib. If you want to spend a little bit more money, then you can actually get an extra fine Japanese nib, like the Pilot Vanishing Point. That is a great work workplace pen. It's a little more expensive. You're going to spend $140, but it's a click pen. And so that is really great because it's very convenient. So you can carry it around with you, click, write with it, click, and you're good to go. So really good for stuff like that. As long as you're not just like clicking it like crazy, driving everybody crazy in your meetings, uh, be careful of that. Um, the Pilot Stargazer has a fine nib. That's a really small kind of compact pen. I really like that. It's got a snap cap, so it's really easy to use. Um, the Pilot Custom 74, that one only has a fine nib. I'm just a huge fan of that pen in general because I just love that pen. I don't know if you can hear my kids screaming in the other room. <laughs> They're okay. They're just playing really uh, enthusiastically. Uh, and then the Platinum 3776 Century has an extra fine nib. And there is one version in the black that has an ultra extra fine nib. Now, we don't get, it, we don't get that pen in stock very often, but uh, that one is a really, really, really fine nib that would work pretty well. Um, so there you go. Those are some of my recommendations as far as pens go. Uh, Ryan G on Facebook said, 
Suggestions. Okay, this question's a little weird, so read into it here. Suggestions. Top bulletproof daily carry pens. Challenge level. May be subjected to teenagers. Context. High school teacher who caves when asked, Mr. Gilbert, can I try that pen? <laughs> so, okay, I think what you're asking for here, Ryan, is you've got uh, your high school teacher and you have uh, teenagers that are asking to borrow your pens and you want some pens that are somewhat indestructible. Okay, I get that. So you wanna keep these on the affordable range so that if they do get destroyed, you're not a total loss, okay? One of my first recommendations, and you're gonna hear me talk about probably all these pens several times throughout these questions because a lot of them are great workplace pens, especially because I had a lot of questions relating to people borrowing pens. Um, but the Pilot Varsity, okay, so that is a what they call a disposable fountain pen. So it comes preloaded with ink. You can get it in several different colors. It's a plastic pen, super durable, it's a couple of bucks, and writes actually really well. So it's a great pen for somebody who doesn't know anything because they don't have to worry about filling it or cleaning it or anything like that. It's affordable enough where you can hand it to somebody, you know, not just hand them out like candy, but if somebody's really showing an active interest in learning more about fountain pens, and you want to let them borrow a pen or give them a pen, you know, I think it's a $3 investment for one of those pens, not the, not the biggest investment in the world, but you can give them a very nice introduction into the smoothness and the flow of writing with a fountain pen without having to give them this whole dissertation about the fountain pen you know, usage. So that's a really good one. Um, if you wanna get a little more involved, the Pilot Metropolitan is a great one. Now that's something that um, you probably won't wanna give any of your teenagers, but it's something that you could use yourself. And if they wanna borrow and write with it, they can bang it around a little bit. And that, that pen can take a bit of a beating. So you should be okay there. And it's $15, so it's, you know, if they do do something to it, it's not the end of the world. Um, and then Jin Hao, their pens, $10, you know, they have the X450, the X750, and the 159. Those are all really like heavy, solid pens that you can give some pretty good abuse to. Um, so those are all good. And then um, worst case, if your kids destroy those nibs, you can actually replace those. Those nibs are the same size as the Noodler's non-flexible nibs, the $2 nibs. So you could replace the Jin Hao nib with one of those $2 Noodler's nibs and then your kids can destroy them all day long. So that, that would be my recommendation. Uh, Wesley S. on Facebook. My two major struggles in daily fountain pen use are how I carry them and the necessity of using cheap paper. Can you recommend some non-dorky ways to carry a fountain pen on my person? <laughs> I'm worried my pants pocket will destroy a nice pen and some blue inks that work well with cheap paper. Okay, so you got two different kind of concepts in here. Um, the first one is how do you carry the pen? And I got a couple of questions kind of about that. I personally don't have like magical answers about how to carry them on your person. The best way that I know is in some kind of case. Now you can get different kinds of cases. The one that I personally have the most experience with is the Aston leather slip case. So it's a $12 deal. It's really just kind of a leather pouch, right? And your pen fits in here. Um, I carry just about any pen in this thing and I can keep it in my laptop bag, which is what I often do. Uh, and when I, cause I'm carrying multiple pens, I will also put this in my pants pocket. I don't carry pens in my pants pocket unless it's a pen like a Jin Hao or a, you know, Pilot Metropolitan or something where it's pretty durable and I'm not too worried about if it gets banged up a little. I don't put that in my pants pocket because um, usually if you got your keys or something like that in there, that's when you can get into trouble scratching it up. Um, so you wanna be careful of that. But if you're carrying a pen, I mean, I carry my Custom 74 all the time, uh, all kinds of other, you know, $100 and up pens in this slip in my pocket, and I've never had any damage to the pen, uh, as long as I'm not, you know, playing pickup games of basketball or something like that with a pen in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> not that I really ever do that, but. I'm not much of a sportsman. Uh, but anyway, so uh, why did I go to that analogy, a pickup basketball game? I don't know. I should say like riding my bike or something because that's mo more likely what would happen. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, wow. Totally just derailed my own train of thought. But anyway, so this personally is like the, the method that I can say that I can vouch to the best as carrying around. Now, 
Other people may have other ideas, and if you do, I would love to hear them about them in the comments, because honestly, this is where I'm falling short a little bit, is other creative ideas. Uh, but this is the best one I find, and it's classy, looks really good. This is, I've been using this one for three years, and it's got some wear on it, but you know, I kind of like that. It's, the leather's very supple, it's held up really well, protects my pens, and so on. Um, and then the other part of it, you asked about um, ink. So blue ink that works well on cheap paper. So um, Noodler's 54th Massachusetts, that's one of the, one, a really good one that I love uh, that works pretty well on most papers. Um, and then Pilot Orochizuku has several different blue inks that all work really well, um, generally speaking, on cheap paper. So Azagao, Ajisai, Kanpeki, Sukiyo, Suyukusa, those are all kind of in a range of blues from the royal blue to the um, kind of purpley, like peri not periwinkle, but the, yeah, I guess periwinkle or royal blue. Um, so those are all some of my recommendations. And again, if anybody has any other recommendations for good blues, again, I don't, unless I'm deliberately testing cheap paper, I actually don't use pens much on cheap paper because here in our workplace, we use decent paper. So <laughs> it's one of the things that I don't extensively test like every ink that I've used on cheap paper. Uh, Michael H. on Facebook, should I feel bad that I like whipping out my Spencerian inspired flex script at work? Furthermore, should I feel bad for having the forethought to fill my vintage watermans with inks that will perform well on the crappy paper at work? Most of the time the reaction is positive, but there's always that rogue look of, well, doesn't he think he's special? <laughs> oh yeah, I could totally get that. You know, it's the kind of thing that like, some people are gonna look at you like you're a weirdo, especially if you're even just using a fountain pen, they're gonna be like, oh, okay, whatever, dude. Uh, but a lot of people are gonna be really intrigued. So, you know, you're just gonna have to take the good with the bad a little bit. Once you start busting out that nice handwriting, you're probably gonna get two reactions. You're either gonna get, oh my gosh, that's incredible. How do you do that? You know, or you're gonna get like, oh, lotty freaking da, look at you. You know, and those people, just don't even worry about them. Just forget them. You know, they're just jealous or they just don't get it. So I wouldn't even sweat it for a second. Unless it's like your boss or something, then maybe you may have to use that, uh, use your judgment on that situation. It kind of, I guess it kind of depends who it is. Um, what you don't want to do is make anybody feel bad or inferior or something. So it's, you know, you, you want to be tactful about when you're doing that. Um, but really, generally, if you've got nice handwriting, you know, you've earned that. That's something that comes with practice. It's something that you've put a lot of thought into and a lot of care. And, you know, you shouldn't really feel bad about it. I think as long as you're not being showy about it, then, then it should be okay. Um, you know, and then maybe what you can do is try to break down the barrier a little bit. If somebody, if somebody's really scoffing and you just don't want anything to do with it, that's one thing. But if somebody's like, just kind of like making a comment or whatever, you know, just engage with them a little bit. Say, hey, look, you know, I do this thing, but you know, this is why. And maybe, you know, write them a nice letter. I've got one of the letters I've got on the wall here. I don't know how well you can see it, but this blue one, it's got like this really elaborate kind of script with this, it's written Goulet Pen Company with this great drawing and everything like that. And it's like, you know, when I got that, I wasn't at all thinking like, oh, look at them, they're showing off. It was like, wow, they took a, obviously took a lot of time to do that for me and it's my name and it's like, that's really cool. So maybe that's something you could try. Gauge the situation, but maybe that's something you could try is, um, you know, doing something personal for that person and say, hey, look, this is really, this is just something I like to do and here's a gift to you. I spent my time, I thought about you, cared about you in order to do this. Maybe a card for their birthday or something, you could do a cool script. You know, that kind of thing might break down the barrier a little bit. I don't know. It's just a, just a thought. Okay, um, Pascal D on Facebook. Not a question, but a suggestion to help out. Okay, cool. Uh, keep a mini travel bottle of ammonia-based, the blue one, cleaner for windows. So like a Windex type thing. Uh, it helps clean up the fountain pen inks on the hands when your pen decides to do a mess or if you do an accident when filling it. Regular soap doesn't work while well, still good to wash hands anyway, but remove the ink, use the blue stuff. So that's a good suggestion. I've also had, personally, I've had good success where, with uh, this stuff called Greenworks. It's like a, it's kind of a, a different type. It's more like a more natural cleaner, I guess, than that heavy ammonia-based stuff. Um, and I've also used citrus-based stuff too. Not so much on my fingers because that stuff really smells, uh, but when I like spill it on a desk or something like that, um, using that kind of cleaner stuff works really, really well. But the key with all that stuff is try and get it early. If you let it sit and soak and, and stain, uh, it's going to be harder to clean. So good suggestion there. Thank you. All right. Uh, Brian HC on Facebook said, I'm a big fan of heavy solid pens like the Monteverde, Monteverde Nighthawk. Uh, can you suggest any other heavy fountain pens in that price range or lower? 
the rest of the Invincia line doesn't count as an answer. <laughs> oh, come on. Like, I mean, I'm, well, you already said it, but I could have shouted out to another Invincia. But uh, for those of you who don't know, the Monteverdi Nighthawk was a previous exclusive edition we had of the Invincia. So all the Monteverdi Invincias are going to fall into that range. Um, okay, so in that price range or lower. So sticking right at that price range, the Monteverde Regatta Sport. That thing is a honker. It's big. It's heavy. It's robust. So if you like heavy solid pens, phew, there you go. It's, and it's right in that price range, right around $100. Um, so that would be right in there uh, along with the Nighthawk. So um, you also have uh, the Lamy Studio. That one is a it's still really solid, but I would say it's a little more, little more delicate than some of those Monteverde pens. But it's definitely, it's all metal, really robust pen as well. Um, the Schaefer 100 is another one. I'm kind of working my way down in price here. Schaefer 100, that's another one to consider. Lots of different color options, but solid metal pen. And then lastly, working my way all the way down, uh, the Jinhao X450, 750, 159. Those things are all very robust, very durable, and those are 10 bucks. So you could get 10 of those and, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, almost treat them disposably for what you would pay for, you know, one, one Monteverde. But that's an option for you too, okay? Uh, Calvin P. on Facebook, in my line of work, I have cause to write letters, notes, cards, etc. to high school and college students. First, what fun, vibrant colors uh, and inks are still easy on the eyes, uh, could be used to write a long note or a very brief letter. Uh, and second, I often find when writing on postcards or in cards that I get extreme feathering with almost any ink or any inks other than Noodler's X Feather that I might get better mileage with. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you got two kind of different components. So the fun, vibrant inks that are easy on the eyes. So the key here is the easy on the eyes part because when you're writing little bits of things, you know, your signature or just quick notes here and there, you can go with a really saturated ink, really bright, vibrant, punchy color and it's okay. But if you're using a stark white paper and you're filling that page with a very vibrant, punchy color, it can be a little bit harder to read. Um, not, not just in terms of like how light the ink might be in terms of not actually being able to read it, but it may just be like, whoa, that's too much. You know, if you're using a hot pink or br some bright oranges or yellows and um, even some like magentas and stuff like that may just be, or some purples too, could just be like, whoa, that's, that's a bit much. And it might be a turnoff for somebody if you're writing them a letter. Um, so some options you could do is go with an ivory paper, an off-white paper. You can still use those vibrant inks, but the off-white paper itself will mute the color a little bit and it'll give less of a contrast for the letter that you're writing. So if you already have a bunch of vibrant punchy colors, you can switch the paper and still be able to use it, have it punch and be really cool looking, but not be so stark, okay? Uh, but no matter whatever paper you're using, you're, you're asking me for ink recommendations. So if you wanna go with stuff that's easier to read and kind of a long chunk of writing, it's better to go with lesser saturated ink colors. So things are gonna shade a little bit better. You know, some, some of the ones I suggested earlier, like the dusty purples, like Diamond Damson, that would be a good one. Um, really the, the um, you could take a really saturated ink, like you know some of the Noodler's inks. You could dilute them a little bit with distilled water and get it more get get a more a less saturated effect. Or you could actually get a whole new ink. You know, Jerobon inks are really good. You know, Schaefer. A lot of the inks that come from the pen makers themselves, um, the pen brands. You know, Lamy ink, that kind of stuff. Those will tend to be a little less punchy and in your face. Uh, because they are less saturated with dye. So really any of those, but um, I like the dusty purples personally for reading back. Those are really good, like the Procure de Lune, Diamond Damson, those are, those are all really good. Um, and then you asked about, uh, you know, what are some um, inks to resist on feathering with postcards and stuff like that. That's really tough because some of those postcards tend to just be really absorbent and a lot of the inks you're gonna have are gonna be tough. Noodler's X Feather is a great ink to try out. Noodler's Black or Heart of Darkness will also be good to try out. Um, but generally pigmented inks I find tend to work well, especially because postcards, you don't know what you're gonna be dealing with. Sometimes you're dealing with super absorbency. Sometimes you're dealing with like a really heavily coated one. Now, if you've got like a plastic coating, like a photo paper almost, nothing is gonna really stick to that because the fountain, the water-based fountain pen ink is really kind of the wrong medium to use on that type. Um, but if, if you've got um, kind of a range and it's a little more towards the upper range, not that completely glossy, like shiny, but if it's just really kind of ink resistant, I find the pigmented inks 
tend to work really well. So the pigmented inks I'm talking about, the platinum, carbon black, pigmented blue, um, also, you know, Sailor, even though I don't carry them anymore, they've got the, their nano inks, which is the um, Seigboku and the Kiraguru or whatever it is. I forget what it is now. I haven't talked about them in so long. Okay. <clears throat> Ray C on Facebook. How would you recommend carrying your pen if all you happen to have are your notebook or planner and your pen? And it's a hot day, so you don't want to keep your pen in a shirt pocket because of body heat making the ink rise in the pen and possibly causing a leak, or in some cases, the pen is getting wet from sweat. Okay, so uh, a couple of options here. If you're really trying to just protect the pen from either getting wet or wetting something with the ink, um, you could carry it, this is a super low-tech solution, but just carry it in a small like Ziploc snack bag or something. Just a plastic barrier would help with that. But however, you probably don't wanna carry around this like plastic bag and pull your pen out if you're gonna be using it a lot. That would be more like if you're traveling somewhere and you weren't gonna be pulling out the pen and using it frequently while you're traveling, you could just do that. You know, if you're gonna be taking a long car trip or something and you aren't gonna be actually using the pen while you're going, that would be a better option for that kind of situation. If it's the kind of thing you're gonna have the pen on you, you wanna whip it out and write with it, that's where I, I personally really like the leather slip. So any moisture and stuff is gonna hit the leather first and not really get on the pen. Even if moisture does get on the pen, sweat or whatever, it's really not the end of the world. You wipe it off, you know, pens, most pens are resistant to moisture because um, that's kind of the environment they live in. So that's okay. Um, and then the other nice thing this is gonna do is help to insulate a little bit from your body heat. So even if you do keep it on your body, um, it will help to insulate that a little bit. Now, of course, there's only so much that can be done. If you're carrying the pen that close to your body in a lot of heat, you really can only do so much. Um, carrying it in a bag or something, or you know, you could go with a, more of a case like this where it won't be as close to your person, um, but then you'd have to like carry it in the laptop case or in your hand or something. I don't know. I don't have a perfect answer for you on that one, but you know, I've been using this pen for three years, or this, uh, yeah, this pen pretty much for three years with this leather slip, and I haven't had, yeah, as much as I carry it on my person or my laptop bag or whatever, and, you know, I'm in central Virginia, and, you know, it's going to be 90 degrees today, and uh, it gets into the hundreds, you know, often enough here in the summertime, and it gets so humid, oh my gosh. Um, I've never really had a problem with either of the things you're describing uh, using this method, so that would be something to consider. Okay. Shira E on Facebook said, the paper at work, okay, in school, is horrible and bleeds badly when I use a Liberty's Elysium on it. Oh, I love that ink. I'm glad you're using that, but I'm sorry that it's bleeding though. Uh, okay, so given that I can't change the paper, nor do I want to change the ink, what can I do? P.S. Using a Japanese fine nib. Okay, so you got a Japanese fine nib, so you're already heading in the direction that I was going to recommend in the first place, which was to get the finest nib possible that you can get. Um, okay, so what can you do? You don't want to change the ink, you can't change the paper, and you already have about the finest nib that you can get. Okay, so you got a couple of different options. Um, one thing, I don't know how good your pen writes upside down, but if you have your pen, um, you can flip the nib over. So that's, it, I, it probably wouldn't work and be very comfortable for a very long period of time, but if you're writing, you know, quick notes and stuff like that, it might, might work in a pinch. Um, but normally you write with the shiny part of the nib facing up. If you flip it over so that the feed is facing up and the shiny part of the nib is facing down, some pens will write better than others, but if you flip the nib over like that, you're gonna get a finer line most of the time, almost all the time. You're gonna get a finer line than if you had it the cor correct way. You wanna be careful doing that, that you're not writing with a lot of pressure so that you bend the nib in the wrong way and it could screw up the way that it writes. Um, and it also might feel a little bit scratchy because you know when they make these nibs, they're not honing them to be written with upside down necessarily. So you may or may not have a great writing experience doing that, but you know, without having to change anything else, that's something you could try. Um, that also works well if you are switching from papers, like if you're using your paper with say a medium nib or something and it's great, and you've got to write on somebody else's paper that you know is terrible, flip the nib, bam, you're good to go. Uh, another thing you could try, okay, um, this is actually something, you could try diluting the ink, okay, and I would do this in a very small volume first, a couple of milliliters, you know, don't do the whole bottle. Um, but that's something that's typically done to help with the dry time, because if you dilute, if there's a lot of dye in the ink, the dry time will be kind of extended. So if you dilute it with more water, the dry time will actually be a little bit faster might be kind of counterintuitive to think if I'm adding wet water, how's that helping the dry time? That's because the water is gonna dry faster than the dye. Um, so 
That helps with dry time. I honestly don't know if diluting would help bleed through as well. I want to say that it might, but I haven't done any testing on it myself. I think I might have read something about it a while ago. So it might be something for you to consider. You know, if you got a little bit of water, you can just mix up a tiny little bit of that ink and dilute it maybe 10, 15, 20%. It wouldn't change the color too much. Um, the more you dilute it, the less saturated the color is gonna get. So once you start to get 25% or more in dilution, you're gonna start to notice that color difference. But if you go just a little bit, it might be enough to kind of help you out. It would be something to experiment with anyway, which I would recommend doing on kind of a small scale. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, changing the ink might just be necessary. You know, specifically with Liberty's Elysium, it does have uh, a strong component to it of permanence. So um, that permanent component, you know, the more permanent, the more bulletproof the inks get, generally speaking, especially with those blues, um, the more it's going to soak and absorb into the paper. You know, if you've got like Liberty Silesium is better than some of the other ones, but if you got like Upper Ganges Blue or Luxury Blue, some of those really permanent Noodler's Blues, um, Bad Belted Kingfisher, all those, those are gonna really absorb heavy into the paper. So um, that's only gonna be exacerbated by really absorbent paper. So you may wanna, you may just wanna experiment with some inks that are less permanent so that you can get kind of more of that um, less, absor less absorbent property to it. So hopefully that helps you out. All right, I'm gonna have to cut in just a couple of minutes here, but I'll try and squeeze in another question or two. Uh, Tom asks on Facebook, what is a good three ring loose leaf paper, plain and lines for fountain pens and ink? Ah, you know, I get asked about this from time to time and I honestly don't have a great answer uh, of anything I carry because Rodia doesn't have anything. Claire Fontaine kind of has a couple options. So <coughs> I don't personally have anything for you. Uh, in my store. Uh, I can recommend a couple things though. So Claire Fontaine has a side wire bound, three hole punched American sized notebook. Uh, and it's the C8267, okay? It's a pretty thick notebook, um, but it's general, um, it's like a general use kind of notebook. It's, it's lined only with margin, I believe. Um, and it's micro perforated, so you can tear the pages out. So it's not loose leaf paper necessarily, but it is, you know, kind of a, a wire bound notebook that you can tear the pages out at least and then put them in a three, three room binder. So that's one option. It's the same great Clairefontaine paper you've used everywhere else, so that would be an option. They don't make a plain version though, so there's, that doesn't help you out there. Um, so I'm gonna have to turn to products that I don't carry to help you out with that. Now Clairefontaine does in France make loose leaf paper, but it's multi-punch multi or something like that. It's not three-hole punch. It has the three holes, but it's also made for European, like the four-hole and five-hole, I think, maybe punch. So there's just holes like all up in the side of that paper. It's a little strange um, if you've never seen it before. It's just holes everywhere on the paper. Um, I don't carry that. It's not a product that's brought regularly into the US. There may be a couple of retailers out there who've special ordered it that might have it available on their site. So just go looking for Clairefontaine loose leaf paper over there on the internets and you should be able to find something. Um, and then the last thing, um, last couple things, this is something I've never used before, but I've heard decent things about it. Um, Staples has a sustainable earth line of paper. It's in like an eco recycled kind of paper that I've heard is pretty good. And I think they have a loose leaf version of that. So check that out. Uh, and then also, if you're going for plain paper, you can just use a laser paper, like a laser copier paper. You wanna get a really high quality, thick laser paper. You don't wanna inkjet paper, cause that stuff's really absorbent. But the best laser paper you can get, I've had really good experience with HP laser paper, the, either the 24 pound, which is pretty good stuff. That's actually what we use around the office here, just for general use um, for printing things. Uh, and then if they have a 32 pound premium laser, that stuff's like close to 20 bucks a ream, which is not that much when you consider like what a Clairefontaine notebook might cost, but the paper is like almost comparable. It's, it's incredible paper. Uh, and that works really well for a, you know, a four size plain paper. All right, I think I got time for one more here. Uh, Shane H on Facebook said, what would you suggest we say or do when someone expresses interest in fountain pens? I tend to get really excited, say everything that comes to mind, and I'm afraid that turns people off because it's too much information. Should we recommend a video or do something else? I was thinking that buying them an introductory pen and the necessary supplies would be a nice gesture, but that seems presumptuous and might constitute an inappropriate workplace gift. 
Um, so you'll have to use your judgment on a lot of this. It's, you know, I think it's awesome that you're so excited about this, Shane, really. I mean, and I want you to harness that excitement and use it for good, okay? The thing you don't want to do is have somebody be like, oh, hey, that's a neat pen, what is that? And you just start, found pens, you know, you don't want to go too crazy. You gotta, you gotta gauge it a little bit. You know, oh yeah, well this is, you know, this is a fountain pen. And yeah, check out this. Oh, really? That's kind of neat. And like kind of gauge their reaction as far as, are they showing interest in it or are they like, oh, that's a neat pen. Oh, we found a pen. Okay, yeah, I'm not really so into that. You know, kind of just probe a little bit and say, oh yeah, this is a fountain pen. You know, I got into this a couple of years ago. Oh, really? I used to use a fountain pen. Yeah. Oh yeah, did you have a good experience with it? Oh no, the thing he linked all, he leaked all over the place. I hated him. You know, then you don't want to go gushing all into it. So you got to get engaged in the conversation a little bit, you know, use your judgment there. Um, one thing that I always recommend, and this the reason I created a lot of the videos that I did is because of new people that are getting into the hobby because I didn't know anything about fountain pens at one point in time, believe it or not. Uh, there's still a lot that I don't know. But one thing that I learned very quickly when I started to know fountain pens is that a lot of other people still have a ton of questions and there wasn't really anybody that was kind of putting it succinctly. Um, so I created all these videos to be able to help people out who had questions, right? And then as I did it for a couple of years, I realized there is, there is a need for kind of this introductory series of videos. So I created the Fountain Pen 101 series of videos, right? I think I'm up to 18 videos now that covers all different kinds of things. And I tried to shoot it in kind of a sequence. So you start out with the first one, which is, you know, uh, kind of like the introduction to fountain pens or the, it's got like the parts of a fountain pen and you know explains a fountain pen how is it different from a ballpoint how is it different from a roller ball those that's really good stuff to kind of get somebody who's got kind of a basic interest in fountain pens and you know you can point them to my fountain pen 101 videos which you can find them on YouTube you can find them on Ink Nouveau on the blog you can find them on gouletpens.com under the fountain of knowledge we've got them listed there as well so those are all just it's all the same information in all three places but you can point people there and say, hey, here's this, you know, weird looking guy that can, uh, <laughs> this, this guy that's 60 pounds heavier than he is now, uh, talking about these videos, I'm, I'm like shake my head at the Fountain Pen 101 now because I'm in like a hoodie sweatshirt and I'm like really overweight and everything. Uh, but you know, it, I, I wasn't going to let that stop me from putting that information out there. So I'm still glad I did those. Of course, I'm thinking like, oh man, I should really redo those at some point. But anyway, um, so yeah, Fountain Pen 101 series is really good. Um, that's that's a good thing. Um, you know, just show them the pen that you're using. Explain a little bit how it works and just talk about, you know, what you really like about it. You know, you, you don't want to go all too much into it unless they're like a really kind of technical person and show a deep interest in kind of how the pen works and all that. Then you can dive into to that kind of information but really just telling them like, oh, I, I really like fountain pens. There's all these cool colors that you can get. You know, you do have to clean it and you have to maintain it a little bit, but you know, I really kind of like that it's something that I can make my own. That, that kind of like higher level selling point, if you will, of fountain pens is usually a little more engaging than diving deep into the technical aspects of the fountain pen, unless somebody's showing that level of interest. But that's usually pretty rare for somebody that doesn't know anything about fountain pens. Usually, usually people will have some kind of basic understanding of what fountain pens are because either they've seen it in the movies or they had someone in their family that used to use them or they themselves used to use them a long time ago. Um, usually that's what's so interesting about the fountain pen hobby is everybody has some broad familiarity with fountain pens, but they've never really used them. So it's always, there's always kind of like this intrigue when you're like, oh yeah, I use fountain pen. Oh really? A fountain pen? Oh, I used to know somebody that, or something like that. It's kind of starts that and you'd be like, oh yeah, man, well, it's really cool. You know, it's like, it's a really old fashioned kind of thing, but I really like it because da 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 da. Bam. And you can talk, talk about it like that. Um, so you, you talked about, um, you know, an introductory pen. So I think uh, unless you've really started to engage, they've used some of your pens and they're really showing an interest, they just don't know where to start. Then I think getting them a gift, like once they're kind of sold on the concept, that wouldn't be super inappropriate. Of course, you have to use your own judgment. And if, you, if it's a work situation and it's your, you know, somebody who works under you or in a different department and you've got relational things to worry about there, you may want to be careful about buying gifts and stuff. If it's like a, custom, a client relationship, you really got to be careful, especially if you're in like the government or anything thing like that where there's contracts involved, you got to be careful. But um, if it's just a coworker, friend or somebody where there's none of that stuff that you have to worry about, um, I think you're okay. Now, the one thing I would recommend is starting out 
inexpensive, right? I like the Pilot Varsity, okay? Because the Pilot Varsity, granted, it's not like the fanciest looking pen. It's a disposable pen. They don't have to worry about filling it. They can just get the writing experience out of that pen without having to worry too much about more of the hassle related things of cleaning, maintaining, and so on, and filling and all that. Uh, and they can, once they're kind of like, oh man, I just, the, the way this thing writes, I just love it. And if it's a color ink, they're like, I just really love writing in this blue, whatever. Um, then they can get a little bit deeper. You know, Pilot Metropolitan is a great pen to suggest because it kind of comes with all the stuff you need to. You know, pens that take cartridges, as much as I hate cartridges, uh, just personally, they are a great and convenient way to get new people into the hobby. Um, so that, that would be another thing that you could um, consider. So um, yeah, that's about all I've got to cover on that. I need to go have lunch. So I'm gonna stop it here and I'm gonna pick up the video on part two. Gosh, I'm only 12 questions in. I still have a bunch more to go, 16 more to go. So uh, this is great stuff though, you know, and hey, you guys keep showing up, you keep watching these videos. So I'm just gonna keep making them. I gotta say, I'm really loving this Q and A format and how informal it is. And the fact that I can just kind of lay back and talk to you guys. I, I get so many great questions. I honestly didn't know how many questions I would get with this whole using your fountain pens thing at web work. I was like, gosh, I'm gonna get like six questions, who knows? And I got blooded with questions and it's like, oh, this is so cool. I'm almost getting too many questions because I want to talk about it so much. I won't shut up and I won't, uh, you know, I can't like cut it back. I don't want to cut a lot of these questions out because they're really good stuff and I got a lot of good things to say. So I don't know, here we go. I'm gonna end up doing like five part videos in the future because I just don't ever want to cut any questions out, uh, generally speaking. But uh, anyway, so that's all I've got for now. Um, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel because I put out a lot of good videos. I work really hard to try and put these out for you. And you know, you subscribing and you watching them, I look at the view counts on the videos and, and the comments I get and stuff. That's one way that I really know that I'm kind of doing the right thing. And so the engagement that I get really helps um, to motivate me to do stuff. Uh, but anyway, so watch out for part two. I'm gonna have part two of the episode 30 here. I don't know if I should call it episode 31 at that point. I don't know if I should do a part one, part two. I haven't really worked that out yet. I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants on this one today, but uh, I'm hungry. I'm going to go eat lunch and then I'm going to come back and shoot part two. Thanks for watching this one uh, and I'll catch you up on part two.